Hello, Disability Law Show. Welcome to it. John Scholes, your host. James Fireman is uh, alongside answering all your questions and emails and uh, doing all the heavy lifting on the show again today. What you got coming up is uh, if you're on LTD and you fear you're about to be cut off, what is the right thing to do? That will be covered in just a bit. Reach out is simple. The phone number first, 1-855-821-5900 help at disabilityrights.ca as well. James, we always start with the week that was. My brother, how are you? Can't complain. Good. So, what do you got going on? Well, one of the things that we do, we have a radio show, actually several radio shows that air across the country, and we take live callers, and oftentimes those callers wind up becoming clients of our firm. Mm -hmm. And in one particular case I'd like to talk about, there was a lady who called in, it was earlier this year, earlier in 2020, and she called in, she had had issues at a fertility clinic, she had taken medications to help with that process and had a very negative physical reaction, which was bad enough as it was, but then consider that that also means that the fertility process wasn't successful. So not only is she having a physical reaction, but there's obviously a very significant psychological and emotional component that comes along with it. And so she received short-term disability benefits, but when she applied for long-term benefits, she was denied, and she was, frankly, I found out later words after getting the insurance file, treated quite poorly by her insured, uh, to be very blunt about it. But so she called into the show looking for some advice, and we took her call, and a few days later I had an off-air conversation, and she wind up retaining me to be her lawyer, and we started a legal claim against the, the long-term disability insurance company. And so, long story short, she was actually able to go back to work late in the summer. So she called me up, said she's feeling a lot better. Her doctors had said she could give it a try. So she went back to work. After about six weeks, she said, you know what, I'm feeling okay. I think this is going to work. So I called up the defense lawyer and I said, listen, my client's been able to return to work. Let's see if we can get this resolved. And we were able to do so. Even though we had a mediation that was scheduled that would be about three or four months from now, we were able to get that resolved without too much difficulty just over the phone and by email. So that was a wonderful success story. But one of the things that really hit home about this case is something that this client told me after she went back to work. What she said is that really it was the day that she called into show to the show and even more the day that she retained us that things really started to turn around for her because she had been struggling not just with the physical effects from the medication and with a heartbreak over not being able to conceive a child but also with the stress and anxiety of having to deal with an insurance company that didn't believe what she was saying and that wasn't paying her the benefits that she knew that she was entitled to and that had a tremendous toll on her and as soon as we started the claim I said to her as I say to all of our clients you're not going to have to deal with the insurance company anymore that's my job that's what we do we're here to take that part of the process off of your shoulders and all you need to do is focus on your treatment and rehabilitation which she did and to her credit she was able to recover sufficiently that she was able to go back to work mm -hmm. so that was a wonderful story but it's not really one that's different from what I hear from a lot of clients that as soon as they start the process contrary to what you might think the stress and anxiety goes down significantly now, when you say uh, you were talking to the insurance company when she went back to work to resolve this, what, is the, what does that exactly mean? Because she's now back at work. Like, what kind of resolution would there be? That's an excellent question. And so it wasn't as though I was saying to the insurance company, you have to pay us not only what you owe today, but also for years into the future. Not at all. What, what she was entitled to were benefits from the date her long-term disability policy kicked in until the date she returned to work. Oh. And that's really all that we asked for. And that's something that really she was entitled to. So it wasn't a very difficult negotiation. Usually when you're at a mediation, you're not just talking about the benefits that the person is owed up to that date. But usually you're looking at a resolution on what we call a full and final basis. So you're looking to get not just up to date, but as far into the future as can be justified by what's in the medical file and the insurance file. And if you're talking about someone who's relatively young, let's say you're talking about someone who's in their early 40s, well, you're talking about 20, maybe even 25 years worth of disability benefits. And if there's a lot of variance in terms of how long the person is likely to remain disabled for, that can make it very difficult for the two sides to come to any sort of agreement where they feel like they're each balancing the risk appropriately. But if you no longer have to worry about the future, if you're just talking about that finite period of time, from when LTD kicked in until when she went back to work, that's much easier to negotiate over. 
Well, you, I mean, you use that, and you've done this in past shows. You used the example just now about someone who's 40 up until they're 65. Why is that number 65 keep coming up? Well, 65 is what we see in a typical long-term disability contract, the cutoff period, the maximum benefit payable period in almost all long-term disability contracts is 65. It's in theory possible that you have one that pays to a different age, a different maximum age, but that is what we see not just the majority of the time, but almost all the time. Email address, help at disabilityrights.ca. You want to use that any time of day, send James an email. He'll answer it himself or he'll send it off to one of his crew. No problem. First one for today is from Victor. Victor says, I've been working in IT for a while, but I had to stop working last year due to my back. The HR department helped me with the forms to get short-term disability benefits, but did not initially tell me that I also had long-term disability coverage. The insurance company recently declined my long-term disability application because I missed the deadline by three months. Is there something I can do? Yeah, there is, and actually it's probably pretty simple. So I can send a letter to the insurer, and I'm going to use a magic phrase called relief from forfeiture. And as soon as the insurance company sees that you have a lawyer writing you a letter and they've put those three words into that letter, they're probably going to change their tune. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to start paying your benefits, but what it does mean is almost certainly they are going to at least accept the application and process it and then make their own determination. It may still well be that after making that determination, they decide that you're not entitled to benefits, and that's a whole other can of worms. But in terms of the insurance company just accepting your application and processing it, that is something where even if they have this three-month or 90-day deadline, in almost all cases, you're going to be able to successfully force the insurance company to accept a late application. Now, if it's five years afterwards, no, the insurance company is going to be uh, quite entitled to refuse to accept that. But really, if you're talking about you know a couple of weeks, a couple of months, even a year in many cases, you're going to be allowed to do it. If forced to, if you have to go to court, the courts have in many cases said you're entitled to what they call relief from forfeiture, which means that the insurance company would not be sufficiently prejudiced in making their decision and therefore has to accept the application. And you don't even necessarily have to have a great excuse. It's better if you have one. Frankly, it's a lot better if you don't miss the deadline. And I'm by no means suggesting that you ought to miss it. All I'm saying is if you find yourself in that situation where you've missed the deadline, don't believe that there's no way around it, that there's nothing that you can do. There certainly is. Give me a call. I'm happy to talk to you. It's a free consultation. And if I can do it simply by sending a letter, I'm happy to do that as well, too. So if your insurance company is saying that you've missed the deadline application, that is something that in many cases can be corrected. Now. I want to make something very clear. There are two different deadlines that often come up in long-term disability claims. One of them is the deadline for application, and that's what we've just been talking about. It's frequently 90 days after you become disabled, and that can be corrected if you miss that in most cases. The other deadline is the two-year limitation period. That is very different. The two-year limitation period applies from the date that you receive a denial of your claim or a termination of your benefits. So from the date the insurance company says to you, you are not or are no longer entitled to receive disability benefits, the clock starts running on this two-year limitation. And if that clock runs out, if two years expire and you have not brought a legal claim to challenge the decision to deny your benefits from the insurance company, within those two years, you're out of luck. There's nothing that you can do, and there's no relief from forfeiture for that. So just make sure you keep those concepts very distinct. Missing the application can be corrected. Okay. Missing the two-year limitation cannot. But in both cases, there is no reason to push the limit. Get the application in on time. Start the legal claim the minute that you get that denial or termination letter from your insurance company. All right, coming up here, you're on LTD, but you think you might be getting cut off. You're getting fear of that. Uh, what do you do? We'll tackle that after a short break. James, in the meantime, the number that uh, James mentioned, one 821 5900 help at disabilityrights.ca is the email address. It's a disability law show. We're coming right back. Don't go anywhere. You lost your job. They only gave you two weeks of severance per year worked. But where can you find out what you're really owed? I'm going to severancepaycalculator.com. Find out how much you're owed right now. Severancepaycalculator.com. You've been denied long-term disability. You think you're powerless, but you have a lot more power than you think. I'll tell you a secret. 
It's a numbers game for the insurance company. They're betting on you walking away from money that they owe you. Don't make that mistake. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savannah and his team, 1-855-821-5900 or go to disabilityrights.ca. You lost your job. They said they had a good reason, but you think you've been wrongfully dismissed. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. All right, welcome back. Thanks for hanging around. Disability Law Show, James Fireman, John Scholes. And uh, by the way, if any time you want to ask some questions when we're not doing the show or a phone call or an email, a third option is mydisabilityquestions.com. It's a website. Go there. You can ask your question, type it in. It's also searchable. So your question may have been asked previously and answered in full. If not, leave it there and a member of the team will get to it, mydisabilityquestions.com. But Here's what we're tackling now, James. You're on LTD. You got the fear that you're going to be cut off. What should you do? First thing you should do if you have not already, completely important, apply for CPP disability. Why so? So CPP disability, let's just step back for one quick second yep. to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about. If you've been paying into the Canada Pension Plan, CPP, for four of the last six years, then you are entitled, if you become disabled, to apply for CPP disability benefits. It's a federal government program, and if you pass their test, then you could be entitled to, I think right now it's up to about $1,400 per month in disability benefits. The test for CPP disability is a different test than what you see for long-term disability. CPP disability requires a severe and prolonged disability, and that is a more difficult test to pass than what you see for long-term disability. Now, if you are approved for CPP disability and you are either receiving long-term disability or you have a claim against your long-term disability because they've denied your, your benefits, those CPP disability benefits are in almost all cases going to be an offset against what your insurer has to pay. So if your insurer is making those monthly payments to you, doing what they should be doing, then the $1,400 or whatever CPP disability is paying you is simply going to be a reduction for what your long-term disability insurer is paying you. Or if you're in a legal claim against them, it's a reduction in what they're going to have to pay you once you resolve that claim. So you may be wondering, well, if the insurance company is ultimately the one who's going to get the benefit of it, then why should I bother going through the process? And there are a few reasons for that. First of all, it's an extra source. So if your long-term disability insurer decides to cut off your benefits, you know at the very least you're going to have those CPP disability, disability benefits coming in. Secondly, and especially if your LTD insurer has actually denied your benefits, not only do you have that benefit coming in, but when you ultimately resolve it, there's less money that you need to recover from your insurer, which means that your legal fees are going to be lower. But the third reason, and this might be the most significant reason of all, is that because the test for CPP disability is a more difficult test than the test for LTD, it makes it very difficult for the insurance company to maintain the position that you're not disabled from work when our federal government is saying that you have a severe and prolonged disability. It's just very difficult for them to say that with a straight face. And so there really is no downside to applying for CPP disability. But the other reason why it's worthwhile is because if you don't apply for CPP disability, your insurance company can then turn, your long-term disability insurance company can turn around and say, well, we're entitled to this offset. If you haven't even applied for it, we're entitled to estimate how much you would have got had you applied and then just take a credit for that amount even though you never actually got it. So there's no downside to applying, but there is plenty of downside if you don't. So please, that should be one of the first things that you do. Another thing you want to do is get your doctor to uh, confirm, number one, that you are still off and you still need your benefits and why, in detail, you are not ready to return to work. Your doctor, mind you, right? Yeah, that's really critical. You want to make sure that the insurance company has all the most recent information from your treating doctors in their hands. And you do that because your insurance company can cut off your benefits. And if they do, you don't want to give them the opportunity to say we were never aware that your treating doctor was saying that you couldn't work or that you had 
this limitation or that restriction. That's not something that was in our knowledge. If the insurance company is aware of it, they don't have that arrow in their quiver. And so they're going to have to come up with some other justification or rely on some other doctor that's never even met you in most cases. And remember, it's your responsibility to make sure that the insurance company has that information. It's not up to the insurance company to do that, and they're usually not going to do the legwork for you. Sometimes they will write to your doctor directly, but even then, I would really make sure that you follow up with your doctor and ensure that they've provided the most recent records because understandably doctors are under a lot of stress, they're very busy, and dealing with insurance companies is typically not what they imagined they would be doing when they went to medical school. It's usually not their favorite part of their job. Some doctors are fantastic at it and are very responsive and make sure that the insurers have everything they need, others less so. And in either case, you want to just make sure that your doctor has sent the insurance company all the information necessary, specifically relating to whether or not you're able to do your job. What we're talking about is you being on disability benefits and you got the fear that you're about to be cut off. The third thing you got to do, James, is call a disability lawyer. I'm going to underline disability lawyer, not your real estate lawyer, not your family. They're all good people, but not what you need in this case. And do not, in any situation, wait or I'm going to throw that magic A word at you, appeal. Yeah, let's talk about the appeal first. <laughs> Can we? So, yeah, the appeal is a process that's invented by the insurance companies. You're not going to find that anywhere in your policy. And I know I talk about this every week, and I know I'm beating a dead horse, but I'm going to continue to do that because people are still appealing. Don't. You're wasting your time. All you're doing is you're allowing the insurance company to continue to make up the rules, to continue to act unreasonably. The appeal process is something that they've created. They make all the rules, and when they decide the appeal, it doesn't go to an independent body, it doesn't go to a judge, it doesn't go to an arbitrator. It usually goes to the very same person that decided your, your denial or your termination of benefits in the first place. So there's not really a whole lot of point in doing it unless you have something that completely changes the nature of the information the insurance company has about your disability and even then it often won't do anything so don't bother appealing but the other part is don't wait don't wait so usually when you get denied benefits if, if you're terminated you don't want to wait there's no point in waiting at all but if you are on if you're on disability if you're getting long-term disability benefits for any period of time and your insurance company decides at some point that they're going to terminate your benefits, they usually don't tell you the day they're terminating you. Usually they give you some notice. Now, sometimes it's only a few weeks, but other times it can be several months, even a year. There is no reason for you to wait until they stop paying to start your legal claim because the clock on your limitation period to bring a legal claim starts running the moment they send you that letter. You only have two years to bring that claim. So once that clock starts running, there's no reason for you to wait to bring the legal claim. The longer you wait to bring the legal claim, the longer it's going to take to get resolved. And if they give you, let's say, six months of notice before they're going to terminate your benefits, they tell you, we're going to cut your benefits off six months from now. Well, if you call a, a disability lawyer now and start the legal claim, there's a fair chance that you might get it resolved before your benefits stop. And if not, you should be able to get them resolved within at least a couple of months after your benefits are terminated. But if you wait, those six months, that means it's just an extra six months that you're going to be without any money coming in, without any benefits from your disability insurer, and without a settlement. Plus, it's not like they're going to just get you to appeal once. They'll keep you on that hamster wheel for a long time, won't they? Sure. They'll, they'll let you appeal in perpetuity. I don't think I can recall seeing a file where the insurance company said, we're not going to permit you to appeal again. And I have seen files where clients have appealed six or seven times and have gotten rejected every time because they couldn't understand why the insurance company couldn't see what was obvious yeah. to their treating doctors. It didn't make sense to them. And what they didn't understand is that insurance companies are corporations and they are there to make profits for their shareholders. They have a vested interest in making money for their shareholders and they do that by cutting off your benefits or by declining to pay you in the first place. That's how they make their money. Once they find a justification to do that, it's very unlikely they're going to change their mind simply because you've decided to say, pretty please, will you do so? They're not going to change their mind. Coming up here, you were denied your claim, plus you got a feeling you're about to lose your job. Okay, now can I appeal? We'll tackle that after a short break. 1-855-821-5900 is the number. Help at disabilityrights.ca's email you can use anytime as well. Come right back. You were being harassed, and when you said something about it, you're the one who lost your job. Now what are you going to do? 
I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Insurance companies deny long-term disability claims all the time. They give lots of excuses. Don't give up. I've seen it all. They've ignored your doctors, they've ignored you. You're angry and you're frustrated. But there's hope. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savan and his team, 1-855-821-5900 or go to disabilityrights.ca. You thought you had a secure job. You didn't see it coming. Now what do you do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back. Thanks for hanging around. Disability Law Show. John Scholes, James Fireman again this week answering all your questions. Another place for you to answer them. I gave you the email before the break. Now I'm going to give you another source, mydisabilityquestions.com. It is a website. Go there, ask your questions, leave it there. The team will answer them. You can also search to see if your question has been asked before and answered. So it's kind of convenient, mydisabilityquestions.com. Here we go, James, from Maria from that exact website. Maria says, I've been collecting disability due to breast cancer and uh, uh, GB syndrome. <laughs> That's my pronunciation. Hope you like it. Uh, I've had multiple surgeries, but I'm not, uh, still not well. My feet continue to burn from all the nerve damage, and I'm not able to return to work yet. My company, however, was recently sold. What will happen to my benefits? Sounds well, familiar. Well, Maria, good news for you. Your benefits are fine as long as your insurer continues to pay them. Right. So if you become disabled and you are, have coverage from insurance company A, Insurance company A is required to continue paying your benefits as long as you remain disabled up until age 65. And that doesn't change if your employer is sold to some other corporation, if your employer decides to change their insurance carrier to a different corporate to a different insurance company, or even if you get fired from your job you're still entitled to continue receiving benefits from that insurance company. So the fact that your employer was sold is really not relevant in determining whether or not you're entitled to the benefits. Now, what can happen if your employer, if, the, if this company was sold and they decide to go on with a different insurance company, so they change the insurance provider, what can happen in those situations is you'll find the insurance company has a bit more of an interest in finding creative ways to get people who are on disability from a policy that they're no longer receiving premiums for to find ways to get them off of that policy, to terminate the coverage in those cases, because they have to continue administering a policy that they're no longer receiving any financial benefit for. So they don't like to do that. And so you should look out, you should be on the lookout for anything that doesn't really seem kosher to you, anything where it seems as though they're pushing the boundaries beyond what you would expect. You want to get some legal advice from that. And we're happy to talk to you. We're happy to talk to anyone who wants to. It's a free consultation. We don't ask for a credit card number you give us a call we'll provide you the information if there's something we can do to help we'll do so help at disabilityrights.ca that's the email address we use as well this one from taylor james says uh, i've been on leave due to depression for two years the insurance company recently cut off my benefits and i just found out that i lost my first appeal my employer is asking me when i'll be returning to work but my doctor and counselor have both told me i can't go back until my condition improves I'm worried about my job. If I appeal, again, will that stop my employer from firing me? Okay, okay I, I know I've talked about this many, many times on this show, but please don't appeal by doing that. All you're doing is you're giving the insurance company control over the situation. It's not going to get you anywhere. I don't need to repeat myself over, so I'm going to move on to what is really the bigger part of Taylor's question here, and that is, how is this going to impact Taylor's relationship with the employer? And that's a situation that really comes up all the time. People are genuinely concerned about the impact that will have, and oftentimes, when you get a denial from an insurance company, or if you were receiving benefits and you get termination of benefits, 
you, the employer is going to write to you and say, hey, what's going on? Just as they have with Taylor here. When are you coming back to work? We understand from the insurance company that you're not disabled. But then on the other side, you've got your own doctor telling you that you are disabled. And so it puts you in a really difficult position because your doctor is saying don't return to work and your employer seems to be forcing you to do so. Mm -hmm. The solution is actually pretty simple in most cases. So when I have clients in that situation, and again, it comes up quite frequently, all I do is I write a letter to the employer and the letter is usually very straightforward. I say despite the fact that the insurance company has come to the conclusion that my client is not disabled, it is the unanimous opinion of my client's medical team that they are, that they are not able to return to work. And until my client is medically fit to return to work, they will not be doing so. They value their job and they look forward to returning once they get medical clearance, but until that time they can't do so and I trust that you won't take any steps to change their employment status. It seems like a very straightforward letter on the surface, but it does a few things. Number one, it tells the employer that you have a lawyer, and that means a lot because it means they've got to act extra careful about how they treat your situation. They don't want you to be hiring a lawyer to sue them for wrongful termination uh, if, you, if they decide to terminate you early, especially while you're disabled, because that's going to expose them to human rights damages, and that's something they really don't want. And when it has the same to mark a name on it, they know that you have access to excellent employment lawyers. It's not a secret. So that's the first thing it does. But the second thing that it does is it sends them a coded message that says, listen, if you act too early on this, you are exposing yourself to a lawsuit here for discrimination. And that's something that no employer really wants. You don't have to explicitly come out and say that. And it's not a threatening letter. It's written in what I would call coded language that the employers, especially larger employers, are going to understand. And when employers get that, they don't, re they don't react badly. More often than not, the vast majority of the time, what they're going to do is they're going to see that letter and they're going to say, okay, let's just take a step back and let's just leave you on unpaid leave until you've resolved your issues with the disability insurer. And then after that, we'll circle back around and see whether or not there's something to be done at that point in time. And that's really what you want. You don't want any resolution on your employment side before the disability insurance dispute has been resolved. Because if you get termination pay from your employer before your disability insurance is resolved, your disability insurer is going to be entitled to get a credit for the benefits that, or for the termination money that you receive from your employer. That's in virtually all long-term disability policies that we see. Is there any way around that that you've, in the past, you've, uh, you've seen? In terms of getting the disability benefits the and the getting employer, the, yeah. the termination benefits. Yeah. Uh, the only real way to get around that is to make sure that you settle the disability claim first. If you've settled the disability claim, then you're free to do whatever you need to with the, with the employer. And if the employer wants to terminate you at that point in time, then you figure out what you're entitled to. And if there's no frustration of contract, what the correct notice period would be. And, you know, I'll leave those things to Lior and his team, who are certainly more well-versed in the employment area. But the reality is you want to make sure that you're dealing with it after the fact. Now, in some situations, you're going to have an employer that doesn't care. They're just going to want to terminate you no matter what. And if that's what they've decided, I can't force them not to do it. Right. All I can do is make sure that they're aware that they're exposed to a human rights claim for a discrimination claim if they act before the disability claim has been resolved. And most of the time they'll understand that. But if they don't, and we have to deal with the employment, employment matter first because your employer is forcing the issue, well, that's fine. Because as I've mentioned before, we have some of the best employment lawyers working at our firm and that's something we can easily address. We are done for another day. You want to reach out, I'll give you a couple of different ways to do so. The phone number, 1-855-821-5900. The email address we use every show, help at disabilityrights.ca. Just disabilityrights.ca is the website. And there's also mydisabilityquestions.com. We'll catch you next time, Disability Law Show. Thanks for hanging around. You thought you had a secure job. You didn't see it coming. Now what do you do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca.